Hey y'all, I'm Christina. And I'm Mary. And we are the Southern Sisters and co-host of the new podcast, True Crime Down Yonder. Each week, Christina and I discuss the creepiest, weirdest, unsettling true crime cases and mysteries of the Deep South. We also cover the paranormal ghost stories and Southern myths that'll give you full body chills. Goosebumps. So join us on Fridays to get your true crime fix with a morbid comical twist. You can listen for free on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We hope y'all will listen and subscribe. Bye, Bye, y'all. Hi, guys. I would like to thank everyone who donates to the Patreon account. The donations keep the show going. My computer is ready to go kaput after eight years, so the Patreon fund will help me get another computer, and that will, in turn, enable me to churn out more episodes. There will be more giveaways in the future, and just a reminder, you don't have to give a lot. A dollar a month would do. Any amount would be appreciated. Once again, the Patreon account is located at www.patreon.com slash leader one that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n and l-e-a-d-e-r-o-n-e thank you and enjoy the show why do you seem so scared all I wanted to do was play with you. Please come and play with me. I am so lonely. You are not afraid of the dark, are you? Don't be afraid. Come with me. I will show you where I play hide and seek. Do you want to play hide and seek? You hide and I'll find you. Lawrence Bittaker was born in 1940. He was abandoned by his birth parents and adopted by Mr. and Mrs. George Bittaker, who lived in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Lawrence was only 12 years old when he began to run afoul of the law. He was caught shoplifting and was indicted, though it did not dissuade him from stealing again, and he was arrested numerous times over the subsequent four years. It got to the point where... When it occurred in his section of town, the police would automatically assume that he was the culprit, and they were more often than not correct. He was generally intelligent, but not enough to devise a plan to ensure his offenses would go undetected by security and police. His IQ was measured at 138, but he did not excel academically due to boredom and lack of interest. He dropped out of high school. His family moved frequently, and he never got the chance to form real and lasting friendships. Roy Norris was born on February 5, 1948, in Greeley, Colorado. He was abused and neglected growing up. His parents blamed him for the fact that they had to marry at a time when they were not ready. They married to avoid being condemned for having a child out of wedlock. Illegitimate children were born into stigma, and the parents were not much better off. Not only did they make it clear to him that they resented him for forcing them to marry, but they also informed him that they never wanted him. Roy was frequently between the home of his mother and father and foster homes. He experienced sexual abuse when he was placed with a Hispanic family. Whatever happened, it was so traumatic he would go on to deplore Latinos for the rest of his life. Typical of such victims, he became sexualized at a very young age. His father worked at a scrapyard. His mother was a drug addict, and the impact on her family was destructive. The Norris family was frequently food insecure and short on clothing. Roy was often deputized into the role of family scapegoat, being punished for transgressions for which he was not to blame. An event happened in Roy Norris's life at the age of 16 that would prove to be among the most seminal. He was living with his parents at the time. 
One day he visited a female relative. She was in her twenties and ordered Roy to leave because he was speaking to her in a manner she described as being sexually suggestive. She informed his father of what he had done. His father threatened to beat him. Anxious to avoid the assault, Roy stole his father's car and drove it to the Rocky Mountains. After his arrival, he attempted suicide by trying to inject an embolism in his bloodstream. It did not go as planned. He was later found by police and returned to his parents. Death was preferable to this fate. The roots of all his problems could be traced back to this one location. His parents told both him and his sister that they were not wanted and that they would initiate divorce proceedings once the children reached adolescence. A year later, Roy Norris enlisted in the Navy. At the time, it was a very common decision among high school dropouts. He was stationed in San Diego as a naval electrician between 1965 and 1969. He was deployed to Vietnam and spent four months there, but he did not participate in combat. Norris began experimenting with drugs in Vietnam and eventually became a full-blooded addict. He started with marijuana and later became hooked on heroin. He was sent back to the United States. He was dishonorably discharged from the Navy on psychological grounds. He started attacking women. Lawrence Bittaker was no longer a petty thief. His career in malfeasance escalated to burglary and auto theft. His motivation for breaking the law back then was monetary gain only. Roy Norris's life of crime was focused not just on drugs, but he was committing violent acts towards women. Bittaker was tried and convicted for hit and run, auto theft, and evading arrest. He was incarcerated in the California Youth Authority. There he would remain until he was 19 years old. His behavior was not rehabilitated, and soon after his release he was arrested again. The FBI arrested him in Louisiana days after he was paroled. He was charged with violating the Interstate Motor Vehicle Theft Act because he drove a stolen vehicle across state lines. He was adjudged guilty in August 1959. He served his 18-month sentence in a federal reformatory in Oklahoma. He was released after serving two-thirds of his sentence. Nothing and nobody could straighten Lawrence Bittaker out. In December 1960, he was arrested for robbery. He was convicted and sentenced to 1 to 15 years in state prison. It was all routine for him at that point. That year, he underwent an examination by a psychiatrist. It was diagnosed with, quote, considerable concealed hostility, end quote. It was also found to be manipulative. They tested his IQ, and though they found him to be highly intelligent, they also noted that he was paranoid and borderline psychotic. In 1962, Bitteker was assessed by a psychiatrist once again. This time he demonstrated characteristics of poor control of impulsive behavior. It was clear beyond a shadow of a doubt that Lawrence Bittaker had serious psychiatric problems. But he was nevertheless paroled early in 1963. He served less than one-sixth of his maximum sentence. There were conditions to which Bittaker was required to adhere when he was paroled. Lawrence Bittaker was a true outlaw, whether law enforcement caught up with him or not. Two months after his release, he was arrested and brought back to prison for a parole violation. He was also suspected of having been involved with another robbery. He was paroled again, but, incorrigible as always, he violated parole and was sent back to prison in October 1964. 1966. Lawrence Bittaker was evaluated by a psychiatrist once more. He said stealing made him feel, quote, important, end quote. 
He also insisted that the crimes for which he was convicted were caused by unfortunate circumstances and free of any instigation on his part. He received a diagnosis of borderline psychosis. He was released from prison, but he was incarcerated again in June 1967 after violating the conditions of his parole. Following his release from this stint, he was arrested for leaving the scene of an accident and for theft. He was sentenced to five years. He was released after serving three years. A year later, he was arrested and received a sentence from six months to 15 years for burglary and a parole violation. He served three years for these transgressions. When he was released in 1974, Bitteker's next crime began as a minor offense, but escalated into something egregiously violent. It started when he went to a supermarket and stole a steak by putting it down his pants. He made it out of the store, but one of the employees caught up with him. Bitteker stabbed him in the chest. The initial charges were for attempted murder and shoplifting, but he was convicted for assault with a deadly weapon. He was released from his sentence in November 1978. Roy Norris began his life in crime in November 1969. He was living in Southern California. That month, he forced his way into a taxi whose driver was female. He tried to rape her. He was arrested soon after and was charged with rape, assault, and attempt to commit rape. He made bail. Three months later, he attacked another woman. He tried to persuade her to let him into her house. She refused. He tried to break in. She called the police and he was apprehended before he could get to her. Norris was determined to follow through on his impulse to rape. In May 1970, he stalked a female student who attended San Diego State University. When he came within striking distance, he bludgeoned her with a rock on the back of her head. He struck her several times until she fell to her knees. He knelt on her back and slammed her head against the sidewalk numerous times. Somehow, the victim survived. Norris was arrested. He was charged with assault with a deadly weapon. Because of his documented record as a psychiatric patient with severe schizoid personality disorder, he served his five-year sentence at the Atascadero State Hospital. Roy Norris was released in 1975. He was placed on five years probation. He was not deemed to be a menace to society. This was a misdiagnosis. Three months after Norris was released, he launched another attack on a woman. She was 27 years old and was walking home in Redondo Beach. He offered her a ride on his motorcycle. She declined. He parked the bike and grabbed the woman's scarf. He twisted it around her throat. He told her he intended to rape her. He dragged her to some bushes nearby and made good on that threat. His victim reported the incident to the police. She was able to recall the appearance of his motorcycle and the license plate number. They tracked Norris down a month later. He was charged with rape and served a year in prison at the California Men's Colony. Fate orchestrated a fateful meeting at the California Men's Colony. Lawrence Bitteker and Roy Norris became acquainted in prison, and it was a meeting of minds. Bitteker later said his first impression of Roy Norris was that he was savvy. Norris taught Bitteker how to make jewelry. Bitteker saved Norris from being attacked on two occasions. Their bond was cemented as they shared their darkest thoughts and fantasies. They were kindred spirits. They even began to discuss plans for crimes on which they would collaborate after being released. They were both interested in sexual violence, and neither one of them wanted their fantasies to be permanently relegated to the realm of imagination. Norris told Bitteker that he found frightened young women sexually arousing. He said it was the reason he committed all the sex offenses. 
There was something about the fear in their eyes while he raped them that gave him a charge. Bittaker said that if he ever got an opportunity to rape a woman, he would kill her afterward so that there would be no witnesses and therefore no way to get caught. Norris had spent far too much time in prison, in his opinion, so he didn't object to that idea either. Norris and Bittaker discussed their plans and ideas on how to rape and murder teenage girls. Not one detail was overlooked. These were not idle threats. Society's young women were unaware of the invisible bullseyes on their backs. They decided they were going to murder girls who represented every year of adolescence, from ages 13 to 19. They decided on exactly seven victims. After establishing the profiles of each victim, they discussed how they would effectively abduct each girl. Bittaker was more fixated on torture and its many possibilities than Norris. All Norris cared about was rape. It was everything to him. They got so worked up about their plans that they vowed to stay in touch after the first was released, and they exchanged contact information. October 15, 1978. Lawrence Bittaker was the first to be paroled. He moved to Los Angeles and worked as a machinist. He befriended many of his new neighborhood's teenagers. He would entice them to hang out with him at the motel where he was staying by offering them alcohol and marijuana. He didn't filter out anybody in particular, but his long-range plan was to ensnare girls. January 15, 1979. Roy Norris was paroled. He moved in with his mother in Redondo Beach. He started working as an electrician. Soon after, he received a letter from Lawrence Bittaker. Late in February, the two men got together at a hotel. They resumed their talks about attacking teenage girls. Lawrence told Roy that he was already hard at work grooming and befriending girls in his neighborhood. With both of them free, they were now able to carry out their nefarious agenda with everything organized and understood. Bittaker devised the idea of using a van to kidnap the girls, feeling it would be more effective than a car due to the concealed rear interior. They combined their financial resources and bought a 1977 GMC cargo van in 1979. There were no windows on the sides, which was a crucial bonus feature for rapists and murderers. The sliding door on the side would also enable them to catch up on a victim and throw her inside with minimal contortion. They outfitted the rear of the van with a bed and coolers for beverages. They also brought a toolbox on board. Items in the toolbox included one large sledgehammer and one pair of pliers. The purpose was to visit pain upon their victims with surgical precision. They gave a nickname to the van, Murder Mac. Many heavy metal fans of the day would hire artists to paint a mural featuring a wizard on the side of their vans. Murder Mac was bland as far as 70s date rape vans go, so they didn't attract a comparable amount of attention. Over the next several months leading up to June, Bittaker and Norris, like a rock band on the road, embarked on the Virgin Sacrifice Tour 79. They sized up the scene, trying to get a sense of where to go to find teenage girls and what they would have to do to get them alone. They would park at crowded beaches. They would meet girls, flirt with them, and even take their pictures. They managed to retain some interest, but they always let the girls go. Years later, Norris would claim that they did this with about 20 girls. Their next objective was to find a place where they could take their victims and have their way with them free of witnesses. Another bonus was that there was a lot of feral wildlife in the area, and animal predation would be an asset after they tossed the corpses aside. After a long, exhaustive search, they found a fire road in the San Gabriel Mountains. It was a remote spot that overlooked Glendora. 
there was a gate blocking entry to the road, but Lawrence Bittaker broke the lock with a crowbar. When Norris and Bittaker took to the beaches to meet young girls, they would lay on the charm so that the girls wouldn't feel threatened or creeped out. They soon discovered that by offering them alcohol and marijuana, the girls would be far more likely to get into the van voluntarily. Getting a hold of alcohol as a minor was usually a challenge, so they were eager to take them up on this offer. They also decided that hitchhikers would make for easy prey. They were now ready to take their plans all the way to fruition. June 24, 1979 16-year-old Lucinda Lynn Schaefer became the first victim of Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris. She departed from a meeting at her church in Redondo Beach. She was spotted by Norris and Bittaker at 7.46 p.m. while she was walking home. The men had been talking to teenage girls all day long, but did not manage to persuade any of them to join them in the van. When Norris got a good look at Lucinda Schaefer, he said, there's a cute little blonde. They pulled up alongside her and did their utmost to entice her to get in the van by offering her marijuana and transportation home. She declined and kept walking. They drove up ahead of her and parked in a driveway. Norris got out of Murder Mac and opened the sliding door. He leaned in to obscure his head and shoulders. Bittaker stayed in the driver's seat. When Lucinda approached, Norris spoke with her briefly and then grabbed her. He dragged her into the van. After he closed the door, Bittaker cranked the volume on the radio as high as it could go, so that if she screamed, it would drown her out. This was a precaution they anticipated as a necessity. Norris tied up Lucinda's arms and legs. He gagged her with duct tape. Onward to the mountains. The fire road. Norris told Bittaker to go for a walk for an hour. He was about to rape Lucinda, and he didn't want anything breaking his concentration. Bittaker returned after an hour. Norris made himself scarce while Bittaker raped Lucinda. She asked him if she was going to be murdered. He told her no. She told him that if she did end up being killed, she wanted some time to say a prayer before being executed. Lucinda Schaefer was murdered that day. It didn't go as smoothly as anticipated. When Roy Norris strangled her, he couldn't handle the look of anguish and panic in her eyes. It disturbed him so much to know that he was the cause of that reaction that he ran away and vomited before he could finish the job. Lawrence Bittaker had a stronger stomach for that sort of thing, so he choked Lucinda until she collapsed within his grasp and went into convulsions. Bittaker went to the van and brought out a wire coat hanger. He twisted it around her neck with the aid of vice grip pliers until he was sure she was dead. She did not get to say her prayer. Norris and Bittaker wrapped her body in a plastic shower curtain. They threw her corpse over a steep canyon. Years later, Norris said Bittaker assured him that the evidence would soon after be scattered by animals. July 8, 1979. Andrea Joy Hall was hitchhiking. Roy Norris and Lawrence Bittaker slowed down and offered her a ride. They liked her and were eager to do their damage to her. However, she was offered a ride by another motorist. They didn't let her go that easily. They followed the car all the way to Redondo Beach, careful to keep their distance. After Andrea got out, Norris hid in the back of the van. They felt she would trust Bittaker more if she were led to believe there was only one man in the van. As he pulled up beside her, Bittaker offered her a beverage. It was a hot day, and she had been hitching for a long time, so she accepted the offer. Bittaker produced a soft drink from the cooler in the back of the van. Just as she reached for it, Roy Norris leapt out of the van at her and grabbed her. 
She resisted him and proved to be a worthy opponent, but he was still able to strong-arm her into the van. Andrea's wrists and ankles were bound. Tape was placed over her mouth to gag her. They drove her to the isolated spot in the San Gabriel Mountains. Bideker raped her, with Norris next in line. Bideker raped her twice, but Norris thought he spotted an approaching car. Bideker placed his hand over Andrea's mouth to keep her silent. He dragged her into some bushes. Norris drove away in a search for the vehicle he thought he saw. He could not find any vehicles, and returned to the spot where he and Lawrence had been raping Andrea. To avoid being seen by anybody who might possibly be driving around the area, they moved further into the mountains, seeking more isolation. Bitteker forced Andrea to walk up a hill by the road, naked. Once they arrived at what they considered to be an ideal spot, Bitteker ordered Andrea to perform oral sex on him. Her next directive was to pose as Bitteker took Polaroid pictures of her. When they returned to the van, they drove her to another location in the mountains. Roy Norris drove away to buy alcohol. Lawrence Bitteker forced Andrea to walk up another hill. When Norris returned, Bitteker was alone. There were no traces of Andrea Hall. He looked at two more Polaroid pictures that were taken of her in his absence. She looked terrified in both photos. Bitteker told Norris he ordered Andrea to run down a list of reasons to spare her life. He apparently wasn't convinced by any of them, for he rammed an ice pick through her ear and into her brain. He turned her body over and shoved the ice pick in her other ear. Still in her ear, he stomped on the ice pick until the handle broke off. Despite these efforts, Andrea Hall was still alive and conscious. Bitterker strangled her to death. He finished her off by throwing her over a cliff. September 3, 1979. 15-year-old Jackie Doris Gilliam and 13-year-old Leia Lamp were sitting at a bus stop near Hermosa Beach. They had been hitchhiking that day. Bitteker and Norris saw them at the bus stop and pulled over. They offered both girls a ride, and they accepted. Once inside, they were offered marijuana, and they were both keen to partake. They became concerned when the van veered off the highway and headed toward the San Gabriel Mountains. They protested that they did not want to go in this direction, but Bitteker and Norris insisted that everything would be okay. The girls were not convinced and Leia Lamp tried to open the sliding door to escape. She received a blow to the back of her head with a bag of lead weights. It left her unconscious for a short time. This allowed Norris to restrain Jackie. While Roy was binding and gagging Jackie, Leia woke and made another move to break free from the van, which was still moving. She nearly hit the ground before Norris twisted her arm behind her back and dragged her back in. When Bitteker got an eyeful of Roy's struggle, he stopped the van and went in back. He punched Jackie in the face. Together the men gagged and bound the girls. The confinement of Jackie Gilliam and Leia Lamp lasted two days. They were continually beaten and raped throughout the subsequent 48 hours. The men slept in the van with the girls, with Norris and Bitteker taking turns as sentries to keep a lookout for interlopers. During that time, Bitteker forced Leia to walk to a hill and pose nude for photographs. When they returned to the van, he told Norris to take Polaroids of him with Jackie, who would appear both naked and with clothes. One time when Bitteker raped Jackie, he recorded the incident on audio tape. He told her to pretend he was her cousin. He also instructed her to cry out as loud as she could whenever she felt pain. He stabbed her breasts with an ice pick. He used a pair of vice grip pliers to tear a chunk off of one of her nipples. 
Jackie Gilliam died first after an ice pick was thrust into both ears. Bittaker brought Leia out of the van. He shouted to her, You wanted to stay a virgin? Now you can die a virgin. He followed this statement by bludgeoning her with a sledgehammer. It did not bring about an instantaneous demise, so he strangled her until she seemed to have died. She didn't die. She opened her eyes. Bittaker pounded her head with the sledgehammer several more times and then strangled her. This time she was dead. Both girls' corpses were thrown over an embankment. October 31st, 1979. 16-year-old Shirley Lynette Ledford was standing by a gas station trying to thumb a ride home after leaving a Halloween party. Roy Norris and Lawrence Bittaker stopped and offered her a ride. She accepted because she recognized Lawrence. She worked at a restaurant part-time, and he was a frequent patron. When Shirley got into the van, they offered her marijuana, but she declined. Bittaker drove them down a secluded street. Roy brandished a knife, threatening Shirley. Having become sufficiently intimidated, he was able to bind her wrists and ankles and gag her. The men changed places, with Bittaker in back with Shirley and Norris on driving duty. They drove around for over an hour. Bittaker removed Shirley's restraints and the gag. The torture commenced. He started by mocking her. He slapped her. The physical abuse escalated to punches. He shouted at her to say something. She began to scream. He shouted at her to scream louder. While she was screaming, he kept hitting her, asking her, What's the matter? Don't you like to scream? Shirley began to cry. She begged Bittaker not to touch her. Ignoring these pleas, he commanded her to scream louder than before. He punched her on her breasts. He integrated weapons into the beatings. He hit her with a hammer. He pinched her with pliers. He even used these instruments while he raped and sodomized her. He inserted the pliers inside of her vagina and anus. He tore both orifices, shredding the skin and making a mess of both. This incident was captured on audio tape as well. Enter Roy Norris. He also shouted at Shirley to scream. He pounded her elbow with a sledgehammer. She cried and told him her elbow was broken. He took up the sledgehammer again and struck her 25 times on the same elbow. He asked her what she was sniveling about when she cried and screamed. The torture went on for about two more hours. It ended when Norris used a wire coat hanger and a pair of pliers to strangle her to death. When it came time to dump her body, they decided not to trouble themselves with driving up to the mountains. They just dumped her on somebody's lawn in the town of Sunland. Because the location was anything but inconspicuous, a jogger spotted Shirley's corpse the next morning. This is a comprehensive list of the injuries the pathologist found on her body. Compression marks on the neck. Petechial hemorrhages, that is, small red or purple spots caused by internal bleeding. Blunt force trauma to the head. Blunt force trauma to the face. Blunt force trauma to the breasts. Tears of the vaginal lining. Tears of the rectal lining. Multiple fractures of the olecranon, or elbow. Lacerations of the fingers. Puncture wound of the hand. Roy Norris and Lawrence Bittaker's actions catalyzed their undoing. On September 30th, 1979, they attempted to kidnap a young girl named Shirley Sanders. They accosted her as she was walking along the road. They asked her if she wanted a ride, but she declined. They weren't about to take this lying down, and they tried again. This time, one of them sprayed her with pepper spray. 
they brought her into the van. They took turns raping her. Before they could take her to a secluded location to kill her, one of them let his guard slip, and she escaped from the van. She ran as fast as she could, and they could not catch her. She reported the incident to the police, but she could not identify the perpetrators, and she didn't commit the license plate to memory. All she could tell police about the van was that it was silver in color. This wasn't much, and the police could not investigate. Norris and Bittiger kept a low profile for the following month and did not offend. Bittiger went as far as to move to another apartment. After this period passed, they went on the hunt for victims once more. October. Roy Norris ran into an old friend from prison named Jimmy Dalton. After getting caught up, Roy boasted about the murders he and Lawrence committed. He described these incidents in graphic detail. Jimmy's initial assumption was that Norris made up the stories to make himself sound important. His perspective changed when the body of Shirley Ledford was found. After hearing about the nature of her injuries, it occurred to him that the trauma inflicted upon her matched up with what Roy Norris described in his stories involving the other victims. Dalton discussed this with his lawyer, and together they reported this to the police. He spoke with detectives of the Los Angeles Police Department. He also met with detectives at Hermosa Beach. Detective Paul Bynum was in charge of the case. He was reluctant to act on this report, since the source of the information was an ex-con whose evidence was purely anecdotal. His perspective on this changed when Dalton mentioned that the men drove a silver van. Bynum remembered that detail from Shirley Sanders' statement. An officer was dispatched to Oregon, where Shirley Sanders lived. He showed her some photographs of offenders and asked her if she could identify her attackers. Roy Norris and Lawrence Bittaker were among them, and she recognized them both. This information was immediately reported to Bynum. Deputy District Attorney Steve Kay examined the evidence. He happened to have prosecuted Norris for a rape case years before. Still, he decided the best course of action was to put Norris and Bittaker under surveillance. It wasn't long before Norris sprung this trap. Police observed as he bought marijuana on November 20th. He was still on parole, and this was a violation. Bittaker was also taken into custody. They were both charged with suspicion of the rape and abduction of Shirley Sanders. It wasn't long before the men started talking. Norris didn't deny that the offenses were committed, but he scapegoated his partner in crime. He told them Bittaker was the ringleader, and that the crimes could not have taken place if not for his leadership and instruction. Meanwhile, the van and their homes were searched. November 30th, Roy Norris was questioned about the rape of Shirley Sanders at a preliminary hearing. He lost his composure under questioning, showing visible signs of distress. He waived the reading of his Miranda rights. He was questioned by Detective Bynum and Stephen Kay. They started by asking him about the rape of Shirley Sanders and eventually moved on to the subject of the rapes and murders he committed with Lawrence Bittaker. He denied involvement at first, but when he was presented with the evidence, he confessed. He continued to insist that Bittaker was more to blame. When police searched the homes of Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris, they found the most damning evidence of all, Almost 500 Polaroid pictures of women and young girls, including Andrea Joy Hall and Jackie Gilliam. They also found bottles of acid, which Norris admitted had been used to torture one of their victims. In the van, they found the sledgehammer and the bag of lead weights. There was a book on how to locate police radio frequencies. Necklaces belonging to two of the victims were discovered. There was a jar of Vaseline on the premises. The most harrowing article of evidence retrieved from the van 
was an audio recording of the torture and murder of Shirley Ledford. Her mother confirmed that it was her voice. The voices of the two men on the tape were verified to be Roy Norris and Lawrence Bittaker. A bracelet that belonged to Shirley Ledford was found in Norris's home. He kept it as a memento. Roy Norris agreed to help the police locate the bodies in the San Gabriel Mountains. The bodies of Lucinda Schaefer and Andrea Hall were not found. Numerous reasons were cited as possible complicating factors, like the fact that the bodies were dumped at night. The remains may also have been scattered by animals. It was also hard to search the area because of the nature of the terrain. February 9th, 1980. The skeletal remains of Jacqueline Leah Lamp and Jackie Gilliam were found by a dry riverbed at the bottom of a canyon. The bones were scattered hither and thither, most likely due to animal predation. Jackie Gilliam's skull was found with the ice pick protruding from an ear canal. Jacqueline's skull was dented in several places from the blows visited upon her by Norris with a sledgehammer. There was abundant evidence to charge Roy Norris and Lawrence Bittaker with four counts of first-degree murder and one count of second-degree murder, all based on the findings of forensic investigators. Roy Norris's case was the first to go to trial. Due to conditions of a plea bargain, his case was closed quickly. Lawrence Bittaker refused to plead guilty. The case not only went to trial, but new details came to light that were theretofore unknown. Part of Norris's plea deal was the condition that he testify against Lawrence Bittaker in court. In exchange for his testimony, the prosecution agreed that they would not seek the death penalty or life imprisonment without parole. March 18th, 1980. Norris formally pled guilty to four counts of first-degree murder, one count of robbery, and two counts of rape. Norris was interviewed by a parole officer about the possibility of his eligibility for parole in the distant future. Norris continued to place most of the blame on Bittaker, saying that he was the one with a penchant for torture. He said that sexual gratification was not his primary motivation for committing the rapes. He said he got his kicks from the domination he achieved. Norris was considered to be devoid of remorse for what he did and felt no compassion for the victims before and after their deaths. The probation officer concluded that Norris was compulsive when inflicting the physical abuse. He closed by diagnosing Norris in the following terms. He can realistically be regarded as an extreme sociopath whose depraved, grotesque pattern of behavior is beyond rehabilitation. Roy Norris was sentenced to 45 years of life with the possibility of parole. January 19, 1981 Bittaker's trial began in Torrance, California. Roy Norris was the star witness. He took the stand on the 22nd. There were other witnesses who claimed Bittaker showed them the photos he took of his victims. Bittaker showed one of them a photo of Jackie Gilliam and said, The girls I get won't talk anymore. Bittaker's defense attorneys argued that Roy Norris committed all the murders and that Bittaker only knew about them based on Norris's recollections. Both defendants downplayed their roles and deflected blame back and forth throughout the trial. February 10th. Prosecutor Stephen Kay felt that only the death penalty was appropriate for an offender like Lawrence Bittaker. He displayed five photos of the victims and described Bittaker as, quote, an excuse for a man. He went on to describe the case as, quote, one of the most shocking, brutal cases in the history of American crime. If the death penalty is not appropriate in this case, when will it ever be? 
The audio recording of Shirley Ledford's torture and murder was played for the court. The content was so disturbing, it didn't need a visual accompaniment to shock the attendees. Some members of the jury cried. Some people couldn't cope with what they heard and left the room. A few of them were so shaken they vomited. Lawrence Bittaker smiled as he listened. Stephen Kay commented on the recording to reporters. Everybody who has heard that tape has had it affect their lives. I just picture those girls, how alone they were when they died. Actor Scott Glenn, who played FBI agent Jack Crawford in The Silence of the Lambs, researched his role by visiting the FBI headquarters in Quantico, Virginia. FBI profiler John Douglas played him the audio of Shirley Ledford's screams. Glenn left the office in tears, he said. I had no idea there were people out there who could do anything like this. He was opposed to the death penalty before hearing the recording. Afterwards, he reversed his position. In the closing arguments for the defense, they contended that Norris was the murderer and that Bittaker's previous offenses were not for violent crime, thereby making it unlikely that he could commit the crimes for which he was charged. March 24th. Lawrence Bittaker was given the death penalty. The judge gave an alternate sentence, should the death penalty be converted to life, of 199 years and four months. Bittaker filed an appeal, but without success. The recording of Shirley Ledford's torture and murder is of poor quality, and you have to concentrate to hear her screams. This is a transcript of the tape. Bittaker slapping Shirley. Say something, girl, huh? Huh? Ledford, what do you want me to say? Bittaker, huh? Huh? Say something, girl. Don't you hit me? Huh? Huh? Say something, girl. Huh? Ledford, ouch! Shirley begins to scream. Bittaker, say something. Come on. You can scream louder than that, can't you? Huh? What's the matter? Don't you like to scream? Slapping sounds can be heard. Ledford screams. Oh no! Bittaker. What's the matter, huh? You want to try again? Ledford screams. Oh no! Don't touch me, no! Bittaker. Huh? You want to try that again? Ledford. Oh no! Don't touch me! No, don't touch me! No! No, 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 no! Bittaker. Want to try again? Ledford. No, 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 no. Shirley was crying unrelentingly by this point. She begged Bittaker to stop touching her. Bittaker, roll over, girl. Ledford, no, don't touch me. Bittaker, roll over. Ledford, pleading, don't touch me. Bittaker, slapped Shirley. Start getting to work, girl. Ledford, don't touch me. Bittaker, Start getting to work, girl. Ledford, crying. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. Bittaker, get to work, girl. Ledford, don't touch me. Bittaker, roll over. I'm not asking you. I'm telling you. Roll over. Ledford is heard crying. Bittaker, come on, come on, come on. What are you doing? What are you doing? Ledford, huh? Bittaker. What are you doing? Ledford. I'm not doing anything. I'm trying to do what you wanted me to do. Bittaker. What did I want you to do? Ledford. Suck on it. Bittaker. Suck on what? Ledford. This. Bittaker. What's this? Ledford. Your dick. Bittaker. Yeah? Say it. Ledford, your dick. Bittaker, you're sucking on my dick? Ledford, that's what you wanted me to do? Bittaker, is that what you're doing? Ledford, yes, I was. Bittaker, tell me. Ledford, yes. 
Bittaker, tell me what you were doing? Ledford, I'm sucking on your dick. Bittaker, do you want to do it? Ledford, you want me to? Bittaker, you want to, girl? Do you want to suck my dick, baby? Huh? Huh? Hey, start answering me. Bittaker can be heard beating her. Ledford, yes. Bittaker, tell me. Ledford, yes. Bittaker, beg me. Ledford, yes. Bittaker, what? Hey, what do you want, girl? Ledford, I want to suck on your dick. Bittaker, you don't sound like you really mean it. Slapping sounds can be heard. Ledford, I do. Bittaker, laughing. Suck on it then. Come on, start sucking on it. No matter what you can do, squeeze hard, you understand? And if it hurts any time, you want to scream, go ahead and scream. Ledford, oh no, she screamed. Bittaker, scream baby, go ahead and scream, scream baby. Bittaker beat Shirley some more. He forced her to perform oral sex on him. She began to scream. He twisted and squeezed her breasts, nipples, and labia with the pliers. He put them back in his toolbox. Banging sounds can be heard, which have been attributed to Shirley flailing about in pain and banging against the wall. Ledford, my God, please stop it, screaming. Bittaker, is the recorder going? Norris, yeah, Bittaker. Scream, baby. Scream some, baby. Ledford. I can't. Bittaker. Scream some more, baby. Come, baby. Come on. Nobody is going to hurt you. Turn over and talk to me nice. Love me. You want nothing more in the world than to make me come, huh? Ledford. The first part of her statement was mumbled, but she ended with, That's right. Bittaker. Say it again, baby. What do you want, huh? What do you want? Ledford. Your cock. Bittaker. Where do you want it, baby, huh? Ledford. I want to hold it and squeeze it. Bittaker. Why? Ledford. It feels good because you like it and I like it. Bittaker. You want me to come, baby? Ledford. Oh, yeah. Bittaker. You want me to come, yeah? Want me to come? Tell me, baby. He slapped and beat her. Ledford. Yeah. Bittaker. Tell me. Ledford. Yeah. Bittaker, huh? Ledford. Oh, yeah. Bittaker. Hey, girl. You want me to put a pair of pliers up your cunt? Ledford. What? Bittaker. You want to make me come, huh? You want to make me come, huh? Huh? Want to make me come, girl? Huh? Ledford. Oh, yes. She screamed. Bittaker. Yes, what? Ledford. I want you to come. Come. She screamed. Come on. Bittaker rammed the pliers into Shirley's vagina. He twisted them. He tore the flesh. She screamed as he did so. Bittaker, stop screaming at me. Come on, talk to me. Ledford, come, 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 please come, 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 come. Bittaker, where do you want me to come, baby? Ledford, I want you to come. Bittaker, where do you want me to come? Ledford, I want you to come. Bittaker, where do you want me to come? Ledford, your cock. I want you to come. Bittaker, come where? Ledford, come. Bittaker, come where? Where do you want me to come? Ledford, in me. Bittaker, where? Ledford, come. Bittaker, where? Ledford, all over, all over. She screamed. No, 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 screamed. Bittaker, is the recorder going? Norris, what? 
Bitteker, is the recorder going? Norris, emphatically, yeah. Ledford, oh no, 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 oh no, she cried. Bitteker inserted the pliers into Shirley's anus. He twisted them until the rectal cavity was torn. More banging noises could be heard. Ledford screamed. Ledford, no, 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 oh, oh, she screamed again. Bitteker and Norris changed places. Bitteker drove while Norris tortured Shirley. Because of the damage done by Bitteker to her anus and vagina, he decided not to rape her. He forced her to perform oral sex on him instead. Norris, make noise there, girl. Go ahead and scream or I'll make you scream. Ledford, in a pleading tone, I'll scream if you stop hitting me. Norris, with an enthusiastic tone, Oh, yeah? Ledford screamed. Norris, keep it up, girl. Ledford screamed some more. Norris, more. Ledford screamed. Norris, till I say stop. Ledford resumed screaming. Moaning and crying could also be heard. The sound of Norris removing the sledgehammer from the toolbox surely began screaming again. Norris smashed her elbow with a sledgehammer. Ledford, you broke it. Norris, I barely hit it. Ledford, pleading and sobbing. Don't hit me again. Norris, oh yeah? Norris took up the sledgehammer once again. Ledford screamed. Ledford, no, 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 no. She screamed some more. Ledford, oh no, 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 no. She screamed after each of the 25 strikes. Norris, how's that? Bitteker, driving. What's going on? Norris, I was just beating on her elbows with this hammer. Bitteker, ah. Ledford, oh. Shirley screamed as Norris struck her elbow with the hammer again. Norris, what are you sniveling about? Ledford screamed. Ledford, no. Oh, ow! She screamed a few more times. Before the recording ended abruptly, Shirley said, Do it! Just kill me! Lawrence Bittaker continued to file appeals, all without success. Roy Norris failed to show at his first parole hearing, leaving him ineligible. Both Bittaker and Norris died in prison. Lawrence Bittaker did an interview with Bizarre Magazine in 2007. Here are a few excerpts. Your case was used during research for The Silence of the Lambs. Have you ever seen the movie? I've seen bits of it, but those types of movies don't appeal to me. I have no preoccupation with murder mysteries or sexual assault mysteries. I can't relate to the movie. It's too wacky. What was your motivation for the crimes? I'm going to tell you the truth. My psychosexual development stopped when I first got incarcerated at 16. I've spent 40 of my 65 years in jail. It destroyed my social and sexual development. I never had a normal upbringing. My family life was like I was a boarder. I don't hate women. I can't understand raping an 80-year-old woman. You're raping someone who's unattractive. Something is screwy with that. But I can understand the rape of an attractive girl who turns you on. I love girls, young and attractive. My fantasy is a girl screaming, but because of pleasure. My whole life, I had no woman who loved me, and that's what I wanted so bad. That's why I took the girls into the mountains. How do you feel about women? I like women. I don't think they're beneath us. I got wrapped up in a screwball fantasy. It wasn't exciting. Well, it was exciting in a certain sense. Age is not relevant as long as they're young and attractive. I got a problem with women anywhere near my adopted mother's age. 
My adopted parents were kind of old when they adopted me, in their 40s. Having sex with a woman of that age reminds me of my mother, a sex object. What happened during the Lamp Gilliam murder? Roy was the one who got excited about having sex. I kind of stumbled into it. Technically, it was rape. They were snatched off the street and tied up, but we treated them well. We partied with them, gave them food, smoked marijuana, and drank. Given the circumstances, it was the most friendly rape situation. I'm the local friendly rapist. You've said you were more attracted to Gilliam. What turned you on about her? She said she was a virgin. You wouldn't know it by doing her. She was mature, well-developed, didn't have wide hips. I can't remember how many times I did it with her over the two days. Had to be three times. We spent Sunday noon to Monday midnight together. The tape I made with her was only a couple of minutes long. I played it later for some kids in my neighborhood. The FBI interviewed you twice to learn about serial killers. What was that experience like? Yeah, John Douglas, a now retired FBI profiler, he thought he was smart. He dressed down for me. He brought another FBI agent, Mary Ellen O'Toole. She was hot. CBS and the FBI were going to produce a show called Criminal Minds, based on my case. That was an hour-long special, prime time. But they weren't allowed to do it because San Quentin wouldn't give them the interview time. What was your problem with Douglas? Well, the first thing I mentioned was that he dressed down. He wore denim and a jacket. This guy thinks he's slick. He thought he could fit in with me. He thought calling a woman a bitch in front of me would get me to like him. He thought he could con me. I wasn't saying anything. I can't blame the guy for trying. He was playing little mind games. He used the term bitches. I don't refer to females as bitches. Are you homosexual, bisexual, or heterosexual? I'm adaptable. Because of my 40 years of incarceration, I have had more sex with men than women. It's easily accessible in prison. It's right there. Why not just do it? I used to live with a woman in Hollywood. She was totally beautiful from the waist up. But when she raised her dress, she was a drag queen. She was from El Salvador. It was available, satisfying. She was a professional entertainer. Did you have a sexual relationship with Roy? Roy is homophobic. He is bigoted and he is racist. I wouldn't talk to him about it. He was not adaptable. Have you ever been married? I was married in 1982 while I was here. She was a born-again Christian. She wrote me a letter when I was in L.A. County Jail. That's how it got started. I called her. She picked up. We started talking. When I got transferred up here, she came to visit me. I asked her to marry me. That was a stupid idea. She was on welfare. She divorced me approximately four years later. She claimed I was impotent. We never had sex. When did you start getting in trouble with the law? I was 12 or 13 years old. I started to shoplift. The first time I can remember, I stole a mustard seed in a glass ball on a chain. It was a present for a female acquaintance. It was just a girl I was with. Was she the first female you had sex with? No sex. Didn't know what sex was until I was 15 had sex with myself. I was 20 when I had my first sexual experience with a female. I was locked up in the Federal Medical Center in Springfield, Missouri for car theft. I don't want to go into the details. People might think I'm crazy. Are you a serial killer? They say I am, so I am. I'm a special serial killer. 
What's a special serial killer? Bittaker just grinned. Do you think about your execution? Why would I want to think about that? He leaned in and spoke softly so the guards couldn't hear. I have it all figured out anyway to commit suicide. Razor blades are sort of messy. I can just black myself out. You just put some pressure on your carotid artery. And if I did that with a wrap of some kind, maybe a belt or cloth, wrap it around my neck, tighten it with a pencil or something. When your brain is not getting any blood, you're in trouble. I'll just fall out and never wake up. What do you have to live for? It's habit, I guess. Everybody who is living, it's just habit. I'm not seeing the end yet, but it's getting closer. Not deciding to die yet. Are you seeing a psychiatrist? It's a psychologist, actually. Her name is Dr. Lewis. She's a prison psychologist. You see, part of the reason I was talking to John Douglas was to contribute something positive out of this whole mess with my case. It didn't work with the FBI. It couldn't because I had all this ongoing litigation. But with a psychologist, although any information I give her is confidential, after I'm gone, maybe she can release the information. We haven't made any plans just yet. Just recently, I started with her. So it sounds like you have some remorse. Just something positive to come out of this whole mess. It's just the right thing to do. How do you spend your time? I spend 23 and a half hours a day in my cell. No condemned have cellmates. My cell is 4.5 feet by 11 feet. I was on the main line, non-condemned, for two and a half years when I first came to San Quentin in 1961 for stealing cars. Anyway, I spend 16 hours a day lying there in the bed. You're allowed to get four books a week from the institutional library. You might request a thriller, but get given a science fiction novel instead. There are collectors of serial killer memorabilia, and your art is highly prized among them. How did you get started in all this? I just started making greeting cards that were interesting. One of the first cards had a picture of a convict. And when you pulled a tail at the bottom of the card, his tongue would come out. Eyes would change color. Pecker would come out. Next one was a variation of that. A picture of just a regular guy you would see on the street. You would open up his trench coat, and the guy would have a humongous erection with a string at the end of it, with a sign that said, Hi! It was just something to do at first, but then I decided to make money so I could buy things in prison and wouldn't have to beg off people on the outside. The prison eventually busted me for unauthorized dealing. Capitalism at work. They gave me all this celebrity. You might as well work it. Thank you for listening to Human Monsters. Bye for now.